the most important video games of all time turns 20 this year, which among other things makes me feel like I'm about to crumble into dust at any moment. It also means people talk about the game's groundbreaking AI again, but sadly never in any real depth. The Half-Life AI has always been an inspiration for me as a developer, with its creatures that felt real, with behaviours that hinted at planning and motive, and layers of depth beyond the immediately obvious. So I thought it would be interesting to break open the source code and then take a deeper look at how it functions and what made it so memorable. Before we can talk about the artificial intelligence, it's worth looking at the technology behind it. Half-Life was written using an updated version of id Software's Quake engine. Quake was written in the C language, however Half-Life uses C++. At this point in time in the 1990s, C++ was still very much a superset of C, so despite the change, much of the Quake engine's architecture and style is carried over. One of the key features that C++ had brought to the table was polymorphism via inheritance. Inheritance is the ability to create a base class for a type of item in your code, and then have a new class inherit the functions and data from that base. Half-Life makes wide use of inheritance, with all the creature types inheriting from a base class that provides them with all their main definitions and core functionality. The child classes then implement the unique behaviours of all the AI agents we know and love, from Barney to Barnacles to Ball Squids. So how does it all work? The first thing the AI needs to do is to understand its world. The Half-Life AI system has two main functions that deal with this. Listen and look. As you can imagine, the look function goes through the entities in the scene and checks to see whether they are visible and that they are in the view cone of the AI. Listen is also quite self-explanatory, it checks against sounds being played and registers them if they can be heard. There's no occlusion for the sound test, so it's basically just a distance check. It's looking to see if the AI's ears are within the sphere of a sound's playback. So if the AI is close enough to a sound, they'll hear it. The AI also has a sense of smell. This, interestingly, is also handled by the listen function. Smells are treated as inaudible sounds. As it would be a distance-based test, it makes sense that it's handled by the same code. The information from the sensory tests, along with a few bits of info from the AI itself, are stored as binary conditions. Examples include seeing an enemy, taking light damage, taking heavy damage, having no ammo in your gun, or the death of an enemy. Every one of these conditions is stored in a bit field in a single 32-bit integer, so each binary digit of the number corresponds to a specific condition. This also means that only 32 possible things can be tracked by an AI, however on the plus side it's beautifully compact and incredibly fast to query. Two special functions exist for any creature that needs to track its own custom condition. The grunt for instance has one to stop them firing in some cases, presumably to stop friendly fire. The AI decides on what to do based on querying these conditions. This allows it to build a schedule. The schedule in its simplest terms is a linear series of tasks to complete. Tasks are single actions in Atomic, meaning they can't be broken down any further. A task could be walking along a path, crouching, flinching, or finding a path to an item. So a schedule is a list that says, go here, do this, do that, and allows the AI to have a more complex behavior and work towards more overarching goals. Schedules also store a bit field of conditions, like the one that AI has, which specify things that would make the schedule invalid and then cause the AI to build a new one. This lets things interrupt the AI on any update, and it's an important part of keeping the AI realistic, reactive, and the gameplay dynamic. So for instance, the schedule for the human grunt shooting an enemy could be stopped by them getting hurt, or by a new enemy appearing, or by the sound of a grenade landing by them, or by losing sight of the enemy. There's no blending of tasks or schedules, so the AI can only do one action at once, unless a task is written that allows it. This means, for instance, the AI can't fire a weapon while moving to a new position. There are, however, tasks that allow them to set a new schedule on completion, and one for if the current schedule fails. For instance, the grenade throwing schedule ends with a task that creates a new schedule for the AI to take cover. So, now we know the basics. 
let's run through a bit of this AI logic on the human grunt in a combat situation. So first we enter the look code. The grunt sees the player, so the scene enemy condition bit flag is set. We then enter the listen code. Some more flags are set. The AI then has a function to pick its enemy. As scene enemy was just set, it picks the best visible target that it can. This means going through every possible enemy and picking the one it dislikes the most. For instance, if there's a scientist standing next to the player, the grunt will target the player as a priority, as they have a worse rated relationship. Then, before creating a schedule, the AI has a think function. This checks to see whether they are in a squad with other marines. If they are, they telegraph the enemy's position to their squad leader. The AI then goes into its logic for maintaining its schedule. As there is no current schedule to continue with, and the grunt is alive, a new one is needed. This is actually the first time we leave functions defined by the monster base class and then enter the code that is actually specific to the grunt child class. Checking against the conditions, a new schedule is created. If the AI is not the leader, they immediately schedule themselves to take cover. If it is the leader, they will start a sentence to announce the enemy. If the condition is set that they can range attack, they will get a schedule and start suppressive fire on them. Otherwise, they'll create a schedule to establish a line of fire by getting closer to the player. Let's assume the grunt isn't the squad leader though, so they've just set their schedule as take cover. It's actually this behavior that splits the squad up and causes the majority of the flanking behaviors players perceive. At that point, we've mostly completed a full update and we start this process all over again, running forward again through to the maintenance schedule function where this time we have a schedule to process. Every update will process the current task in the schedule and when it's completed, move on to the task after that. The first task in our schedule is to stop moving. Next, we set a special schedule task for if this one gets interrupted. In this case, a schedule for when taking cover fails. The next task is to wait 0.2 seconds giving the AI a small pause to make it a bit more natural, let the animations finish, and to give the player a short window to fire on them. After that pause, the following task is to find cover from the enemy. They will first attempt to find lateral cover, cover that puts something between them and the enemy. Otherwise, they'll just try and find any cover they can. If they can't find any, the task fails, setting off that special schedule we just set for the, just for this eventuality. Let's assume we did find cover though. Then, now that we know the task is possible, a speak task is fired off. In this case, the Marine will shout, speak cover. Having this after the checks means the AI won't say when it's about to do something and then not do it. This was obviously a problem at some point as it's mentioned in the code comments. The next task is to run along the path to the cover. The schedule then has a task that waits for the movement to be completed. Then, a bit is set in the Marine's memory state to remember that they're in cover. This information's not being used anywhere in the code base though. There's a lot of incomplete or unused code like this, perhaps hinting at ideas they had, but never implemented. The final task is to set a new schedule. The AI will immediately move on to this one on completion. In this case, the grunt will wait in cover. They'll stop moving, set their activity state as idle, and then face towards the enemy and wait a whole second. The schedule is now complete, so the next time we hit the maintenance function, we'll need to grab a new schedule. After the movement, the condition bit field tells the AI that the enemy is now occluded. The grunt can't see them due to the cover we've just dived into. However, the flag for the second view ranged attack is set, and one saying the grunt has a grenade. The function sets the grunt to shout that they are throwing a grenade. grenade. The schedule for the secondary ranged attack throwing grenade is set as the current one, and so the process continues on. As we've now seen, this system of schedules gives the developer a powerful tool to design chains of behaviors that can effectively plan and execute quite complex goals. And even though many of the ways the task computed lacks any deep sophistication, for instance, the lack of squad communication and planning, a careful attention to sound design helps carry the believability of the system's creatures. 
It's also worth mentioning the level design as a core component of the AI too. Many of the creatures rely on the careful placement of items and obstacles in the levels for them to appear lifelike. For instance, large crates or pillars provide sporadic cover for the marines to move between, and if placed well can cause interesting flanking maneuvers by the squad as they drop in and out of cover. In conclusion, I think it's the way these different systems have come together, logic, sound, level design, even the animations and art that sells the living creatures of Half-Life. No single great piece of genius code, just careful attention to detail, a flexible system for easy design and iteration, and a close collaboration between different disciplines. I hope you enjoyed this little look at Half-Life's AI system. I might come back and do another one soon. Perhaps we could look at Fear, or even Half-Life 2. Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you later.